Well, good morning. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Pastor Steve Hackman. I'm pastor here at Shorehaven Lutheran Church, and it is an honor to serve and to guide and to be the source of comfort uh, for you today as we mourn the death of Ann Jennison, but as we also thank God for the gift that she has been to our lives. A couple of notes on the service. You should have been given a bulletin. Please make sure you have that handy. As you flip through it, you will notice, oh, look, there's a couple of hymns. That means we get to sing. And these hymns are chosen by the family to help us uh, reflect upon the faith that Anne confessed and the truth of God's word uh, that is given to us. Uh, you will also see that some of the text is in big, bold print. That is your opportunity to speak back to me what I have prompted just before that. And so we have a dialogue within the worship service. And so I invite you to continue to keep this at hand, follow along, everything you need is in your bulletin. As we begin uh, this funeral service, I would like to invite up Brittany and Samantha to share some reflections from the family. For those I may not have met yet, my name is Brittany. Is it on? Yeah, it's a little closer to the microphone. Okay. Is that better? There you go. <laughs> For those I may not have met yet, my name is Brittany. I'm one of Grandma Annie's 14 great-grandchildren. I'd like to start by thanking all of you for being here to celebrate her incredible life and legacy. Death is such a strange thing. We've known that this was coming, and we prepared for it as best as we could. I thought that I had accepted it, and then it happened, and life forever changed in an instant. I sat for a week trying to write the perfect speech, but how do you sum up 102 years? Instead, I'd like to let you all love her through my eyes for just a moment. Her favorite color was green, in case you couldn't guess. <laughs> she loved sunflowers and just about every living animal, though I doubt the ostrich was her favorite. <laughs> she was the life of every party. She treated everyone like family, whether she'd known you forever or she just met you. Cherry Coke and Kahlua and cream were her drinks of choice, never water. She was absolutely hilarious, kind, and gentle, and she loved her family deeply and ferociously. I spent most of my childhood at Gramps. My cousins and I would have sleepovers there. She would take every picture off the wall so they wouldn't fall on you and lay pillows on the floor in case you fell off the couch. We'd stay up all night watching movies. Curly Sue, Prancer, Wizard of Oz, and Shrek were amongst her favorites. I have many special memories of my years spent at Grandma's house, like being lathered in Vicks until my eyes burned every time I was sick, or being reminded to have lots of fun but don't get wet when you go swimming. I remember her idea of giving you a bath was spraying you with the hose from the utility sink and lathering you up with Joy dish soap. I also have many intimate memories there, like holding her hand while I labored with my firstborn in her living room. My children's first stops on our way home from the hospital were always to see her. She picked both of my daughter's names. Name her Chloe, because they used to call me Flowey. And that's exactly what I did. She was more than just a grandmother. She was my best friend. <laughs> Grandma Annie was the most beautiful soul I've ever known. And she's at the center of each and every one of our most cherished memories. She never missed a thing, and none of us ever missed a chance to be where she was. Trips to the zoo or wagon trails 
the Lionsville Spillway, Manor's Tree Farm, road trips to Pennsylvania, or even just a lazy afternoon all started with, if Graham's going, I'll be there. I remember the first promise she ever made me. I was about six years old and asked her to live forever. She looked ever so lovingly into my eyes and said, unfortunately, no one can live forever. So I thought of the highest number I could think of and asked again. Okay, Grandma, you have to live to 102. And okay, she told me. I promise I'll live to 102. She kept that promise. I'm so incredibly blessed that she met all four of my children and made it to see me marry the love of my life. That's all I ever wanted. Her life was long and beautiful, filled with so many joyous memories. Today truly is a celebration of that life. 102 years, four children, nine grandchildren, 14 great-grandchildren, and 20 great-great-grandchildren. She lived more than a lifetime. Now we figure out what life looks like without her. I don't know how to do that but I'll try every day to make her proud. That's a good place to start. Love you, Graham. Thanks for everything. How do I follow that? Good morning, and thank you all for coming to celebrate the life of my grandmother, Flora Marie Jennison, a.k.a. Annie, or as many of us in this room knew her as Graham. For those of you here that do not know me, my name is Samantha, and I am the daughter of her only son, Robert McCrary, or as many of, or all of you knew him as Corky. I came to this family late in the game, and I'd like to tell you about the day that I met this wonderful soul because it's truly an amazing story and it's my favorite story to tell. It was the day of my father's memorial service in 2001 right here in this church. I pulled into a parking lot and I was greeted by a dark haired woman with glasses and one of the biggest smiles I had ever seen. She came to my car door and said, you must be Samantha. I'm your Aunt Sandy. And we held each other for a few minutes and cried. And then she took my hand and led me to a crowd of people and said, someone's waiting to meet you. The crowd seemed to shift their attention to me and I and almost formed a circle. On the other side of the circle, I saw a woman with a cane and I instantly knew that was her. She looked so much like my father. I could barely breathe at the sight of her. She took a few steps towards me, and I felt my knees begin to shake. I walked towards her, and we met in the middle of the circle, and then at that moment we embraced for the very first time. It was beautiful. I still remember it like it was yesterday. I remember just staring at her, trying to memorize her face, which I believe I did in its every detail. At the service, I was sitting next to her and Aunt Sandy while we were holding hands. She looked me straight in the face and said something I will never forget. She said, no one should ever have to bury their child. My heart broke for her. At that moment, I knew she was the absolute strongest woman I had ever met. I was so involved with everything going on that I didn't really think of the fact that this was her baby. And even though he was a grown man and a father of four children, it, this was her firstborn. 
her, her only son, her pride and joy, as she would say. I remember standing and pointing to the gentleman in front of me and saying, that's her brother. And I remember staring at the back of his head, trying to see right through him and see him and trying so hard to figure out what he might look like. I searched the room for familiarity. I tried to find a face that looked like mine or a resemblance to the man I, we, had just lost. The man we were there to honor, but I, I didn't find any. It was my turn to get up, and with a squeeze from my grandmother's hand, I had the confidence to get up and tell my story. On my way to the altar, I glanced at the gentleman sitting in front of me, as I could now see his face. There it was, familiarity. I really don't know to this day how I got up in front of a bunch of strangers and told a story of a man who had also left them at one point. I didn't know if I would get booed off stage or just simply ignored. I knew that backstory as all of you do. I couldn't change any of that, but I could relate because I was left too. Twice now. I guess when people die, we resent them a little bit for leaving us, especially when we need them the most. I came to a point in my life where I had forgiven my father for leaving me at three years old, but now, after meeting all of you, I did resent the past. I wish I had grown up in this family and had the memories of Graham the way you all did. I'm trying to let that hurt go, but I do struggle with it, especially on this day. When we hear memories of the things she did that I didn't know about. And the fact that I had 23 years with her in life makes me feel very proud and blessed for sure, beyond measure. And most of all, loved. I knew, I know, that she loved me just as much as she loved everyone here. We had a very special bond that I never thought I would have with her. I was super protective of her in every facet of the way you can be. Lord, help anyone who hurt her feelings in the slightest, because I am not a confrontational person, but with her, I would let anyone know exactly how they made her feel with no remorse or feelings for my actions. This woman is and was and always will be the most profound influence in my life. I just cannot imagine her not being here. And now that we're all faced with that emptiness, I'm very proud of this family because we all came together for her every single time. Just like we're all here for her now. But most of all, we're here for each other. We are all her pride and joy. We are all the result of her love and her protection. And as I look around this room today, I see familiarity. I see her in all of us. Her love is undying and unwavering love. As for memories of Graham, I don't believe I have any to contribute that you all haven't been a part of. This day will be full of memories from all of you, so I will relish in your memories of joy and delight and also grief. I will share one thing with all of you before I end this in hopes that you might understand our bond and love for each other. When Graham first started to falter, she had a conversation with me in private that I have shared before, but I would like to share again one last time. We were sitting in the living room one morning and it was quiet, just the two of us. And she said to me, Samantha, I just want you to know that although you haven't I just want you to know that you haven't been here your whole life, but you've made my life complete. These past 20 years of my life have been the best because of you. Your mom and dad are waiting for me. They're here now, so I don't want you to worry about me. I'll always be with you. So, Graham... Since you're here with me and all of us now, I just want you to know that I love you with all my heart. And I will miss you terribly. And I will part with the last words you've said to me. It's not goodbye. It's so long.
the love that I have seen in this family in just the five years I've served here is overwhelming. And it is a joy to listen to the depth of the love through Brittany and through Samantha. So thank you both very much for your honesty and for your reflections. And those reflections are going to continue as you interact with each other day to day, week to week, month to month. And there may be times when some of those interactions are going to bring some tears. Those might be tears of joy, of things and did. They may be tears of the loss that we are feeling today. There may be even laughter that comes out. But God has given us these wonderful emotions to not keep everything inside. But as these young ladies have done for us today, your expressing of those emotions allows you to be vulnerable, to allow somebody else to support you. Cry when you need to. Laugh when you want to. Rejoice all the time for the gift of Anne in our lives. As we begin our service today, I just have one last announcement. During the last hymn, we will begin the processional out. As soon as the, uh, the music to the um, last hymn begins, I'm going to ask the pallbearers to please rise and just meet us in the narthex. The funeral directors will then lead Anne out the sanctuary and as the hymn is sung, I will ask the first five rows of family to please begin their recessional behind Anne. The pallbearers will meet Anne in the narthex, and they will then assist her into the hearse. And then as soon as uh, that hymn is done, I'm going to ask everyone to please be seated still until our postlude is done. That will allow for the bottleneck of people to dissipate a little bit. Take your time, support one another this day, and as we begin our service, would you please stand? Remembering our own baptisms, we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. In holy baptism... Ann Jennison was clothed with the robe of Christ's righteousness that covered all her sin. We remember the words of St. Paul. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. You may be seated for the singing of our hymn. Like me. 
let us pray. O God of grace and mercy, we give thanks for your loving kindness shown to Anne and to all your servants who, having finished their course in faith, now rest from their labors. Grant that we also may be faithful unto death and receive the crown of eternal life through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We all look for comfort during times of death. And God promises that through his word, you will find comfort and strength for your lives. And so our first reading today comes from the 53rd chapter of the prophet Isaiah. Who has believed what they heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of the dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And as from one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our grief, he has carried our sorrow, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquity. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. With his stripes, we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned away, every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Perhaps one of the most beloved psalms in the entire scripture is Psalm 23. And I invite you to join with me and read it together. And when David wrote this, he was reflecting upon his own role as shepherd. And he looked at God and sought the Lord. God himself is my shepherd. And often as we read this, we often tend to think of ourselves as the sheep and God as the shepherd. But as we read through it today, I invite you to pay close attention to the verbs. And I realize, oh good, what's a verb? (laughs) Do I have to go back to English class and figure that out? But as you look at those words, pay close attention to where the action is coming from. Because it's not coming from the sheep. All the verbs are focused on God to you. We share this psalm together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our epistle reading comes from St. Peter's second letter, chapter 3. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of a reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through the apostles, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last day with scoffing, following their sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God and that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. 
But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the, day, with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please rise and join us in our verse for today in preparation of hearing the Lord's holy gospel. If we have died with Christ, we shall also live with him. If we are faithful to the end, we shall reign with him. The Holy Gospel for today from St. Matthew chapter 6. Glory to you, O Lord. And Jesus said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of his life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you O you of little faith, therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated for the singing of our hymn. divine, all wondrous beauty I 
was on that old cross. Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. To the old rugged cross I will ever be true, its shame and reproach gladly bear. For he'll call me someday to my home far away, where his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday. Your family and friends, God's grace, that undeserved love, his mercy, his eternal compassion, and his peace are yours. They are gifts to you from God our Father, gifted to you through our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Just a little over, uh, well, gosh, 10 days ago, I was visiting Anne in the afternoon with the family. They had uh, just let me know that Anne had been placed under the wonderful care of hospice. Hospice was providing good care, not only just the resources that, that they provide as someone moves from life to death, but they were providing family support to help with the emotions, to help with understanding death a little more. You know, during that visit, I I asked the family, share with me about Anne. I I think I used the prompt, so tell me about Anne. And for the first time in 53 funeral family visitations in the five years that I've been here, everyone gave me the same answer in unison. They all looked at me, lifted up their head and said, she was stubborn. (laughs) Well, that kind of caught me off guard. (laughs) Usually I hear things like, oh, they were caring, and then somebody else chimes in with family was a priority, and somebody else chimed in, oh, the community is going to miss them. No, you can... No, every single one of you sat there and said, Anne was stubborn. So that caused me to listen a little bit harder. Usually, if somebody's characterized as stubborn, it's not said in a positive or loving spirit. But when Carol and Kim, Emil and Peggy, yes, I called you all out, (laughs) when they said she was stubborn, it was said with the greatest amount of love and admiration I think I've ever seen. It was grandma's way. And as they continued to speak, they continued to unpack what it meant for Anne to be stubborn and how she lived that. You see, Anne had a way of doing things. When the family got together, I was told, you can always expect Anne to bring her baked beans. Always. And as the children were were a test, she did it her way. No recipe. Take the ingredients, add them together, mix them up, bake them up, and serve them. And they said they always tasted better because Anne made them not just with one sweetener, but with molasses, brown sugar, and white sugar all added into the mix. That was Anne's way. 
Halloween would come around, and Anne had some rules. No suckers, no hard candy. Those are choking hazards. So she paid the children money to hand over those candies. That was grandma's way. Those who have lawns, any of you have a lawn in front of your house? All of you live in like somebody else takes care of your lawn? How many of you have lawns in front of your house? How many in the spring and summer see these little yellow dandelions start peeking through the grass? Okay, a few of you take care of your lawns by keeping them away. Well, when they showed up with in Anne's yard, and we all know how stubborn dandelions can be, Anne was determined to make sure they were not going to grow up in her yard, so she armed herself with a butcher knife from the kitchen and dug them up. That was Anne's way. She enjoyed living and bringing others along in the joy of life. In her 102 years, as Brittany and Samantha shared, you cannot sum it up. So we, we find the themes and we run with them. We allow the many memories to flood our minds. She enjoyed everything from roller skating and bowling to her infamous practical jokes to having a purse full of random objects that were make her the prime studio audience member on the classic TV game show, Let's Make a Deal. Now, I've only known Anne for five years. But each time I visited to bring her news of what's going on in the church or encouragement from God's holy word or to bring her the Lord's Supper, the visit may start with me and Anne chatting. But slowly and with regularity family members just began to show up it might be from another room it might be from outside but they always flowed in and the conversation expanded from Anne and me to me and the children and the grandchildren and what's going on with the great-grandchildren you have a great great-grandchildren coming up the pastoral visit became the pastoral family visit and that was the way Anne liked it you see Anne's house was always one that welcomed family she would create events just to get the family together maybe they're gathering for a summer cookout or maybe they're having a teddy bear party or maybe we're gonna get together just cuz it's Wednesday and Christmas you were not excused from Christmas unless you were dead. Coming together as family, that was Anne's way. And to simply say this is Anne's way, that's actually too simple. We can't just explain the things she did as, well, that's who she was. That's the way Anne was wired. That would actually sell her short. In fact, Anne may have known how she liked things and stubborn enough to make sure they happened her way, but Anne met, met and learned that there was actually somebody more stubborn than her. She found that God was more stubborn than she was. Our reading from 2 Peter, and it's written in your, in your bulletin so you can reflect on it later, it speaks of God's stubbornness. During the time when Peter, one of Jesus' own disciples, during the time when he wrote that letter, Christians were not being treated very nicely by Rome or the world. Many Christians began to wonder if God had forgotten about them. After all, Jesus said, I'm coming soon. He said, where I'm going, I'm going to come back and take you to where I am. And so they were waiting. Jesus, we think you're late. There were many who watched the disciples, who watched the early Christians, and they made fun of them by holding on tightly to the promise of Jesus. And Peter writes, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. 
In other words, God is stubbornly patient towards the people of this world so that they too have opportunity to hear and know of his love for them. Anne was 62 years old before she was baptized. And it happened here at this church on the 13th day of July, 1983. She stood before the congregation and said, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, and in the Holy Spirit. She confessed the truth of what Scripture declares. And as Pastor Cohn poured the water of baptism on her head, God adopted Anne and welcomed her into his family. In God's stubborn patience, Anne became a child of God, a follower of Jesus. Now when we say that the love of God is stubborn, it means God is patient. God desires all people to know the real depth of his love. When mankind sinned, and we can go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, he didn't turn his back on those sinners and wait for them to clean up their act before re-extending his love to them. No. We see a patient, stubborn love at that moment. God continued in his relationship with Adam and Eve. He was the one who provided clothing to cover them. He continued to guide them through the struggles that sin brought into this life. He continued to provide everything they needed as we confessed in Psalm 23. As Jesus spoke in our gospel reading, he provides everything we need for this life. God continued to stubbornly love these sinners and all their descendants, you and me included. The depth of God's stubborn love and his commitment to man was promised as God revealed, I will put on human flesh myself. I will live the perfect life you cannot live. I will die the death that will satisfy God's judgment against sin and I will rise again in order that all these people will be able to live with me forever. That gift of forgiveness, that promise of eternal life, it's still extended to you. It's extended to everyone in this world. But many refuse to receive God's gift. Many can't understand how God could love them and take the punishment of their sin on himself. Many don't understand the depth of that kind of love. Many don't feel worthy to even receive that kind of love. But that's the love that Jesus lived and taught, and died for. Jesus said, it is finished. And in those words, God declared that I have taken care of the payment of your sin. Your debt is paid. Jesus said it this way, greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends, and you are my friends. That was the stubborn love that Anne learned. She saw it modeled by God in Jesus, and she lived that same stubborn love in her life. And many of you have been recipients of that stubborn love. The house on Ravik, that has been home to many of you and the family members at some point in your life. It's a place where Anne said, you live here. And we'll get your feet set till you have your own place. Nothing in the house ever went to waste either. Whether it was clothing, canned goods, leftovers, spare furniture. Anne's heart was always wondering, who could use this? She gave of herself as the regular babysitter of her children and grandchildren allowing her children to leave their children with her so that they could work or save money, money that might have been spent elsewhere on child care. But it wasn't just love to her family where she was stubborn. 
and wanted them to know the depths that she would go for them. She also loved wildlife. It didn't matter if it was the cats or the Costa Spaniel or the neighborhood squirrels or the deer or the raccoons or even Charlie the Crow. They all received a consistent, stubborn love that Anne poured out as food for all <laughs> year round. And they all kept coming back. You see, Anne lived out how Jesus described God's providing love in our gospel. He said, don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink, for your heavenly Father knows that you need them. As God provided for Anne, Anne provided for many. And as we reflect upon Anne's life, we simply in awe just turn back to God and say, thank you, God, for that gift of Anne. Thank you for blessing my life with Anne. For as we look there, we see the stubborn love is just a mirror of God's more stubborn love for each one of us. And this world may seem hard, as we heard from Brittany. How do we take that next first step? That can be hard. And it may seem that today death has had the final word, but sometimes we get stuck in only hearing the wages of sin is death, which is true. We see death today. It's a result of sin. It disrupts our lives. It interferes with our relationships. It causes us struggles. And yet God has declared in the next part of that verse, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. This is not the final word. Death may have said, I claim and now. But by her faith in Christ, God has had the final word because death simply opened the gate for Anne to enjoy a perfect, eternal life. So as you look at death today, I invite you not to keep your eyes cast down, but lift them up. Lift them up to see the image of death that's greater than this death. Look up and see the image of death where Christ died on the cross but is raised to eternal life, never to die again. And those who trust in his death and resurrection, they will also meet death and rise again on the last day. That's good news. Good news of God's stubborn love. And we all need to be reminded of it. Anne needed the reminder of it each time I visited or they tuned in the live stream services or she opened her devotions each and every day. She needed to be reminded of God's stubborn love for her, a love that was shown in Jesus. And then she lived out that love to each member of her family and all of her friends and her church. Well, since Thursday, February 24th, Anne has been enjoying the very perfect relationship with God. It took 102 years, but Anne now lives where sin can no longer disrupt it, where she is safe and at peace in the very arms of Jesus. And one day she will, Jesus will return and will raise this body to be a perfect and glorified body that will not age, that will not feel pain, that will never hunger or thirst, never again cry, God will raise all the dead to have perfect bodies. And there will be a great reunion. And for those who trusted Jesus in this life, for their forgiveness and the promise of eternal life, they will share with Anne and with Christ forever a perfect eternal life. We don't know when that day is going to be. But we do know this. God has stubbornly and lovingly delayed the coming of that day so that more will know of his stubborn love shown to you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Would you please rise? And with one voice, please join together as we speak the Apostles' Creed.
God has made us his people through baptism into Christ, living together in trust and hope. Let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, and he descended into hell. And the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have knit your chosen people together into one communion in the mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Give to your whole church in heaven and on earth your light and your peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant that all who have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection may die to sin and rise to the newness of life and so pass with him through the gate of death and grave to our joyful resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant that all who have been nourished by the holy body and blood of your Son be raised to immortality and incorruption to be seated with him at your heavenly banquet. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give to the family of Anne and to all who mourn comfort in their grief and assure confidence in your loving care. And let them cast all their sorrow on you so that they may know the consolation of your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give courage and faith to the bereaved that within the communion of your church they may have strength to meet the days ahead in the assurance and certain hope of the joyful expectation of eternal life with those they love who have already departed in the faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Help us, we pray. In the midst of things we cannot understand, to believe and find comfort in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive our thanks for Anne and for all the blessings you shed on her in this earthly life. Bring us at last to our heavenly home that with her we will see you face to face in the joy of paradise. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God of grace, you sent your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to bring life and immortality to life. We give you thanks that by his death he destroyed the power of death. And by his resurrection, he opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Strengthen us in the confidence that because he lives, we shall also live. And that neither death, nor life, nor things present, nor things to come, will ever be able to separate us from your love, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting in his promises, We are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Lord, now you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people. A light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. He who believes in me, even though he dies, will live, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And the Lord be with you. Let us pray. 
Lord God, our shepherd, you gather the lambs of your flock into the arms of your mercy and you bring them home. Comfort us with the certain hope of the resurrection to everlasting life and a joyful reunion with those we love who have died in the faith. And this we pray through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. At this time, I invite the pallbearers to please meet us in the narthex. despise forsake thee take it to the lord in prayer in his arms he'll take and shield 